Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, and High Tech Oki. Coming up on DTNS, the downside of energy-saving thermostats, why Johnny Ive and Apple finally split up, and our comprehensive timeline of Elon Musk and Twitter will help you make sense of the whole debacle. And it might have might have just been a chance for me to say the word debacle. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 13th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In Debacle Central, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. <laughs> yeah, a man whose job is to prevent this from being a debacle, Roger mm. Chang. Yep. <laughs> Let's start with a few tech things you should know. At CES 2021, LG teased a rollable smartphone just before it announced its exit from the smartphone market. You may have remembered those those came uh, fairly close to each other. The company then sold its prototypes to employees, one of which posted a video of a working rollable unit. It shows a rather slim, foldable phone able to be unfurled using a hardware or software toggle. While the LG will probably never come to market as an LG... Oppo showed off the Oppo X 2021 rollable concept last year. Still looked really cool. TikTok will introduce content levels, a new system to restrict mature content from teen viewers. TikTok will also introduce the ability to filter out videos using desig excuse me, designated words and hashtags. An early version of content levels will launch in the coming weeks. The Magic Leap 2 AR will launch on September 30th. Those are words that many years ago I would never have believed I would say, uh, not the least of which because it's got a two in the name. The Magic Leap 2 AR will start at $3,299, and if you're a developer, you'll pay $4,099. Uh, you get extra stuff with that, though. The headset offers up to a 70-degree field of view, resolution of 4K at 30 frames per second, or 1080p at 60 frames. Inside, it has an AMD quad-core Zen 2 chip, and anyone could buy the headset, but Magic Leap is marketing them for enterprise use, hence the higher price tag. Yeah, definitely pricing them for that. Uh, Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai informed Google employees the company would slow hiring for the rest of 2022. The company will still hire for engineering, technical, and other critical roles, they say, but Pichai said the company will have to work with, quote, greater urgency, sharper focus, and more hunger, unquote. <laughs> so they're getting rid of the chef? Is that I don't know how the hunger part really threw me. Yeah. But. <laughs> uh, nothing, the company, announced the phone one. Now, you'd be forgiven if you thought they'd already announced it, since they announced something about it pretty much every day for the past two months leading up to this. Uh, but if you missed those uh, pre-announcements, it's an Android 12 phone, 120 hertz OLED display, semi-custom Qualcomm Snapdragon 778 sock, two rear 50 megapixel camera sensors with wide and telephoto lenses, and support for wireless and reverse wireless charging. Uh, as already shown, it has a transparent back with integrated LEDs that can be customized for notifications starting at 399 pounds, going on sale July 21st in the UK, Europe, Australia, India, and a few other countries. But we know a lot of you are in the US. The US is not one of those other countries. Oh, I was hoping we would have nothing. Get it? We won't get nothing. Oh, Wait, that ne double negative finally works. <laughs> I know. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, let's talk about your smart thermostat. You have a smart thermostat, Scott? I do. I've got a, uh, the turtle one. I forgot the brand. Oh, B, no, B, Echo B, Eco B. That's Eco B. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, in the winter, you may be causing a problem with it. Uh, engineers at Cornell have paper coming in the journal Applied Energy called Unintended Consequences of Smart Thermostats in the transition to electrified heating. So one of the premises here is a lot of folks are switching from natural gas heat to electric heat in order to be able to take advantage of renewable energy sources like solar and wind, etc. Smart thermostat users can choose to share their anonymous data with electrical utilities for research purposes. So Li and Zhang, the uh, authors of this study, were able to examine wintertime data for more than 2,200 homes in New York State. Here's what they found. One thing was that homeowners tend to use factory defaults, and therefore they don't save as much energy as they could. They save between 5 and 8% off their bill, when customizations might bring that number to 25 to 30%. Their study also showed that while smart thermostats do lower overall energy consumption, they also, and I quote, 
severely increase the winter peak heating demand through load synchronization during the early morning hours when solar energy is unavailable. In other words, this isn't the smart thermostats talking to each other, but they all have pretty much the same default behavior. And as we just heard, people don't change the default behavior, so they're all doing the same thing at the same time. And smart thermostats often are turning down the heat at night when you're asleep and you don't feel it, and then slowly ramping it back up so the house is warm when you wake up. That saves you energy, but maintains your comfort. However, as more homes get smart thermostats, it causes a spike in energy using energy usage in the morning as all those start ramping up. Uh, the study found that peak heating demand in early morning hours was 40% higher than previously estimated, and that winter peak usually comes when solar is unavailable, because in the winter at 6 a.m., you got no sun. That means wind and fossil fuels have to step in to meet the demand. So good news that wind could still meet the demand, but you don't have as much wind, so you end up burning more fossil fuels because of this peak, right? Mm. The lower the lower energy usage is still there overall, but you're causing a bunch of use at, at one particular time, which means you're increasing fossil fuel use. Uh, the authors also provide an open source toolkit for analyzing this kind of data in other regions besides New York if folks want to step in and try to replicate their results. It almost feels like the perfect analogy for complication um, in, in the sense that, you know, in a vacuum, one person buys a smart thermostat or a small number of people do. And you can see those immediate savings um, more if you know how to customize the thing. But the problem is you're going to end up in a pattern with a lot of people like you and you're all going to spike at the same time hard to foresee that necessarily i mean maybe they could have or maybe maybe this is only an issue now that the uptake on the technology is so much greater than it used to be more people have these in their homes than ever and new homes go in with them for the most part or a lot of them do um so i guess i'm not surprised to see that we're running into this but as far as solutions what the heck do people do like are they gonna have i mean it may have to come from the software level or the I don't know what level, but but people at home are like, I don't want to manage this any more than I have to. The whole idea yeah. was that it was easy and it's on my phone. I have to think about it. Now you may have to think about it. You may have to figure out how to stagger. Do do communities say, well, look, um, anybody within this zip code or within this area code or however you want to break it down, you need to be doing this at eight and the rest of you at nine. And like that gets complicated and hard to manage and you have a scale problem. So I, I don't know if there's an easy answer or an easy yeah. solution. I think there are answers. They they may or may not be easy, but they're policy answers, which which can be easy or difficult, depending. But uh, S. Kelly 2909 in our chat points out it's a common issue with scheduled jobs and computers. And Nick with a C says, shouldn't a smart thermostat be smart enough to know to avoid the spikes? And the answer is yes, with both of them. I take part in a uh, plan with LADWP that I allow them for a credit on my bill to adjust my thermostat during the summer when there's peak AC demand. Mm -hmm. So they'll go in and they'll like, they'll nudge it up a little bit and it'll get a little hotter in the house, but they do it in a way that's like, it's going to maintain your comfort level. It's just going to make sure that we're all kind of, you know, getting a little, little less energy usage in that peak time. You could do something like that in the winter as well. Uh, and, and like Nick suggests, have the smart thermostats actually be able to understand, oh, there there is peak energy that we would all be using. Let's get anonymized data that tells when that is and we can adjust so that the peaks come at a little different time and, and flatten that curve out a little bit. Yeah, I'd like that idea a whole lot. And the idea of that working would require some cooperation between power companies, both the uh, those run by states and those run by independent corporations to communicate in some way that could be standardized so that all these devices could like you said, read from that data and respond accordingly. I yeah. really think that's probably the answer. That one seems tricky, but not undoable. So because you can you can get rid of the smart thermostats altogether, but then you've increased overall energy use because they they do reduce demand. That's the thing they found is they reduce the energy usage. It's just we found this one little quirk that causes a spike here. So if we can fix that. We get the reduced energy usage and everything else is, is better too. Interesting yeah. study. And, and Roger, to, uh, yeah. nice job finding this. Yeah, it's really good. It's it's definitely one of those things where step forward, a couple of tweaks, don't step back. We'll, we'll figure yeah, this yeah. out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the New York Times, uh, they're, they've got some sources. Uh, they say Apple and Johnny Ives design firm, Love From is the name of his uh, design firm, have ended their contract. Oh, man, if you thought they're already broken up, it's official now. 
Love From signed a deal with Apple in 2019, which made Apple its primary client and restricted it from taking on work that might be deemed competitive. So Samsung or, you know, think other competitive uh, markets that Apple might be in. Um, I've had reportedly consulted on the design of the Apple car, the Apple mixed reality headset, and also reportedly clashed with development teams sometimes on those and other teams. Apple uh, COO Jeff Williams will continue to manage Apple's design teams. Evans Hankley will lead industrial design and Alan Dye will lead software design. So, hey, that everyone's favorite couple, they're finally calling it quits. They're done. Yeah. You knew when 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 I've moved out of the house that that <laughs> and they were going to try to make that relationship work, but it was it was going to be hard. Yeah. So I, I don't think it's a shock to anybody. Uh, I wondered, and Stoke Squirrel basically said the same thing in our chat room just now. But I I wondered just how much of Ives work was being used because mm. uh, it sounds, and again I don't know, I'm not inside, but it sounds like he was pushing for things that they would go, okay, but that's not really practical or that's not really the vision. Uh, some of this is helpful, but I never got the sense that they were like, ah, and and here's another one of those love from designs that Apple, you know, they didn't play it up like they would have otherwise. And plus it's against Apple's culture to play up outside help. So I kind of feel like Apple was always going to be like, yeah, you know what? We're just going to design it in-house from now on, Johnny, mm -hmm. which means now you're going to get a bunch of other companies trumpeting the fact that they've got love from designs by Johnny Ive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like it's there. In some ways, it's probably a relief for him because he can jump out to markets he couldn't previously. And in some ways, this is just the stopping of Apple's kindness toward a man whose, whose design sensibilities and the teams he helped lead really did define the look and feel of that company with their great comeback in the late 90s throughout the 2000s. Yeah. He deserves a lot of credit for that stuff, like a, for sure. an amazing amount of credit. And there's a reason why we look at him and go, oh, Johnny Ive, he's the, the, the lord of all design teams. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, even though we may still be looking at computers that are a lot like Johnny Ive's original designs to some of those changes, aluminum shells, all the notebooks, right. as he would put it, um, you know, the iMac and its general unfazed changes in the in the in the intervening years. Um, you know, his influence clearly stayed and is still there in terms of overall design aesthetic. But I think moving forward, they probably can make this work and and have it be amicable and he can head on his way and do his awesome work for other people and Apple can continue. Yeah down the path they're on and I, I just don't i guess what i'm saying is it's not like tomorrow we're going to get big clunky beige boxes for max it's not gonna right. it's not gonna right. go away um but you know it is also i think important to honor this period that he was there because without his you know his design i'm not sure we would have the same at least the same apple we have today so props for that but time to move on yeah and, and he probably is the kind of person that needed to be in from the ground up to really benefit a team and being yeah. an outside consultant doesn't really give him that opportunity. So yeah. in the end, Apple said, I've had enough. <laughs> I've had enough. I was afraid that joke was going to come up. I was more afraid it was going to come from me. I'm really glad <laughs> that it came from you and not me because I know, I, you know, I know how these jokes can go for days and days and days and I'd be getting cheesed on Twitter, but no, it's Tom you want to talk to. So yes, uh, we need help. We need help people. We need your help promoting <laughs> next week's special guest week. Uh, we've got great guests and we would like you to help us tell everyone about them. Uh, Jack Resider from uh, Darknet Diaries is going to be on the show. Will Smith from Foo VR, formerly of Tested. Uh, Quinn Nelson from Snazzy Labs. Joel Telling, the 3D printing nerd. It, it's a don't miss week. Uh, and it's the week to get your friends to be like, hey, check out Daily Tech News Show. They got some cool folks. So if you could, please get out there wherever you tell people about things, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, uh, Be Real, whatever it is, uh, tell folks they, they got to check out Special Guest Week on Daily Tech News Show all next week. Twitter has filed a lawsuit in Delaware, the state of Delaware, against Elon Musk because... He no longer wants to buy Twitter, if you guys may have heard of this. For those following the saga, it's worth catching up on and, uh, you know, what happened before, because it's hard to remember or even keep track of it all, honestly. So, previously on Elon, Elon Musk and Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I really think this is going to help uh, put things into perspective, because it's to remind you of things that you forgot about. We begin with the prelims, wherein Musk buys a piece of Twitter, just a big old bite of it, just a little taste 
March 14th, Elon Musk bought 9.2% of Twitter's stock, making him the largest individual to be a shareholder and the second largest overall shareholder behind Vanguard Group. Uh, then he didn't tell anyone about it. So he did it on March 14th, but nobody knew about it. March 24th, he tweets a poll asking if Twitter's algorithm should be open sourced. March 25th, he asked people if they, they thought the platform rigorously adhered to free speech. Rigorously. March 26th, he asked if a new platform was needed. And everybody wondered, why is Musk picking on Twitter? What's this all about? Well, April 4th, Musk disclosed in an SEC filing that he had purchased that 9.2% of Twitter stock and a uh, hat tip to Wedbush analyst Dan Ives, who at the time told CNBC that that purchase could lead to some sort of buyout. Now, this was longer than the 10 days normally required to disclose the stake, and he got a little hot water about that. But April 5th, Twitter offered Musk a seat on the board. They said, look, you're the second largest shareholder, first largest person. So in exchange, if you'll limit the amount of stock you will acquire to 14.9% and agree to take part in strategic decisions, but not on moderation policies, we'll give you a seat on the board. And that seemed to be the thing, like, we don't want Musk to try to take us over. That same morning, Musk said he would not join the board. But again, we didn't know that for five days because it wasn't until April 10th that CEO Parag Agrawal told employees and then said publicly that Musk would not join the board. At that point, we thought, that's it. Right, Scott? Well, April 11th, we keep moving forward. Musk amended an SEC filing to remove the mention of the share purchase limit and add the idea of, quote, potential business combinations and strategic alternatives, unquote. In other words, now he was free to buy a larger stake in Twitter and even discuss buying it publicly ah, or otherwise. Bush was right. Was <laughs> right. <laughs> April 14th. Let's jump to that. Elon Musk offers to purchase Twitter for 54.2 a share. That's $54.20 a share. Around $43 billion was the translation at the time. He called a best and final offer and said he would reconsider his existing stake in the company if it was declined. So, one day later, April 15th, 2022, Twitter adopts a poison pill strategy that gave existing shareholders the ability to buy additional shares at a discount to dilute Musk's ownership stake and prevent this hostile takeover, or if one was planned. This did not mean Twitter didn't want to be acquired so much as it meant they wanted to negotiate the terms if it was required or acquired by Musk or anyone else for that matter. At that time, the New York Post and Bloomberg both reported that private equity firm Tama, uh, Tama Brava was working on a possible bid for Twitter as well. Now, let's jump uh, another six days or so. April 21st, 2022. April, or excuse me, uh, Twitter has, had still not responded to Musk's offer. Musk filed with the SEC uh, that he had arranged financing to tender and offer directly to shareholders something that would spark the poison pill to go into effect. Would he risk the poison pill is the big question. Ah, a cliffhanger ending to this episode. Uh, at this point, I want to remind you all, you all thought, oh, Musk is going to try to just take over Twitter. He's going to make a hostile takeover. He really wants to buy Twitter. All us armchair quarterbacks thought he's going to risk the poison pill. And the answer was no, he wouldn't. Uh, in fact, he didn't have to. April 25th, Twitter accepted Musk's offer to purchase Twitter at $54.20 a share, which at that point was significantly above what it was trading at. It's even much more above what it's trading at now. Uh, in the agreement, Musk waived due diligence, no outs, no like, hey, you didn't tell me that. He agreed to a clause called a specific performance clause, which gave Twitter the right to sue if he didn't follow through with the deal, which, by the way, spoiler alert, they will, uh, both sides agreed to a $1 billion breakup fee should the acquisition fail to close, and Twitter would have to pay it if it decided to sell to someone else or if Twitter shareholders voted against the deal. So Twitter would have to pay the billion in those cases. Neither one of those things have happened. Musk would owe that amount if his financing failed or if regulatory reasons prevented him from closing. So it's not as simple as... Musk can just walk away from the deal and pay a billion dollars. April 29th, Reuters reported that Musk had secured loans to make up about half the purchase price by promising to cut costs. So he was going to do half the price himself and loans for the other half. On May 5th, 
Larry Ellison, Sequoia, and Binance, the uh, crypto company, all committed funds to invest in Musk's acquisition, cutting the number, the amount of the loan that he would have to get. In fact, Binance chief executive Changpeng Zhao told the Financial Times his crypto exchange would offer Elon Musk a blank check. So we're good. The financing is locked. Musk is getting Twitter. It's just a matter of crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And everybody's freaking out about what's he going to do when he gets Twitter. There's no, is he really want it? There's, well, maybe there's a couple of people out there that feel real smart now. But most people were like, well, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? He's totally going to buy it. Right, Scott? But wait, Tom, there's more. <laughs> May 13th. I would point your, uh, your eyes to that big day. Elon Musk tweeted that his deal to acquire t uh, Twitter was, quote, temporarily on hold pending details supporting calculation that spam slash fake accounts do indeed represent less than 5% of users, unquote. Twitter claimed that the number in its SEC, uh, SEC filing was that. And he followed that post with another saying, uh, still committed to acquisition. So at that time, it seemed like, okay, maybe still going to go through with it. May 16th at the event in Miami Musk, or at that event. Uh, at an in, event in Miami. In Miami, sorry. <laughs> Miami Musk, buy it today, said a deal at the lower price wasn't, quote, out of the question on the 17th. That's important. In that Miami, important. he told people, not out of the question at a lower price. Maybe I can get a lower price. Exactly. If somebody needs to make a Miami Musk. Anyway, May 17th, the very next day. Musk tweeted again that Twitter needed to convince him of the accuracy of its spam bot percentage. The Spark Toro report estimated the number at 19%, but counted legitimate automated accounts like those from news companies that auto post their own headlines. Musk cited a figure of 20%. I forgot about those guys as well. Anyway, mm -hmm. Twitter issued statements saying it is committed to completing the transaction on the agreed price and terms as promptly as practical. On the 26th, Twitter shareholders file another class action lawsuit allegedly, alleging violation of California corporate laws and market manipulation. Now we go all the way to the 8th of June. Twitter granted Elon Musk access to its fire hose of data, all of it. Just here it is. You go through the data. You tell us what's wrong. Uh, they had already given him their methodology, which Musk found inefficient uh, at the time. June 16th, Musk meets with Twitter employees to announce questions or answer questions and says nothing particularly surprising for anyone about you know, whether or not he's going to buy the company, whether he should buy the company. Cyber relief turns out it was just a bump in the road. They give him the data. He met with the employees, just a little drama, no big deal. Not unusual for Musk. It's all good. Right. But then <laughs> after a month of relative quiet on July 8th, Musk sent a letter to Twitter saying he would not proceed with the acquisition because of Twitter's quote, materially inaccurate representations and that Twitter failed or refused to provide relevant business information regarding spam accounts. He's trying to say, you can't just give me the fire hose. Come on. You, you got to show me exactly what your findings say about the 5%. So he waived his due diligence, but he's pursuing an idea called material adverse effect which allows you to break a contract without penalty if you can prove that the business you're trying to acquire differs dramatically from what you agreed to buy. Uh, if Scott tries to sell me a car dealership, and when I investigate, I find out it's a laundromat, I can say, wait, the contract's off. You were selling me a car dealership. So right. Musk is trying to argue, they told me it was full of users. It's full of spam. However, the SEC filing did not include evidence that the number was wrong. So he made this filing say, I'm not buying it. It's a material adverse effect because there's too much spam. He just asserts that he has reason to believe that the spam bots are substantially higher than Twitter claims. So Twitter hired the firm Wachta, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz, whose founder, Michael Lipton, is credited with inventing the poison pill defense against takeovers. Somebody has a lot of experience in this. On July 12th, Twitter filed a lawsuit against Elon Musk in the Delaware Court of Chancery alleging that Musk violated the specific performance clause of the contract. Remember we mentioned that? The no. specific performance clause that he agreed to, that Twitter put in and said, uh, if you try to walk away from this without reason, we can sue you. Well, they're, they're taking advantage of that clause. They're filing the lawsuit. And July 13th, Hindenburg Research, a short seller. They have been advocating short selling Twitter up until this point. Hindenburg researcher Hindenburg research has now taken a long position on Twitter 
which has the effect of raising Twitter's stock price. Hindenburg said it believes Twitter's lawsuit poses, quote, a credible threat to Musk's empire. <laughs> Scott, what will happen next? Tune in and find out. Yeah, you'll have to tune in and find out, and I'll bet you'll talk about it here. But I really appreciate the chance to hear and talk about this in a way that is a, a far as far away from whether you're a fan of Musk or a fan of Twitter or you hate both or you like one and don't like the other. Forget about all that. Like what is actually happening or what has happened up to this point? It's really fascinating. And I still am a little bit confused about everyone's motivations. Like what does everyone really want here? But at the end of the day, I'm glad we can do it in a way that's like apart from all that drama, you know? Yeah. I, I don't feel like it's likely that Musk is just trolling. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't, I don't feel like it's likely that he, uh, he didn't know what he was getting into. He did. Uh, but that said, I'm not sure what's going on. It really does. When you read through that timeline, it feels like he knew exactly what he was doing. He bought a little bit of the company. He entertained a board seat because that's, you know, a good thing to do, you know, to, to just be like, let me entertain the idea. But he rejected it immediately. He wanted to buy the company from the beginning. Now, one thing that was unexpected that happened after he decided to buy the company is Tesla stock went down. Yeah. Uh, which which he probably did not expect. The other thing that has happened is that inflation has continued to go up and the economy has tanked and the price of Twitter has gone down, even with Hindenburg Research stepping in at the end. If he were to make an offer today, he would make a substantially lower offer and still be accepted. So I'm, I'm starting to settle on the most likely thing is that he wants a better price. Yeah. And that if he can't get the better price, he'll walk away. So, yeah. that, so in other words, he doesn't want to pay $54 anymore. He's like, it's too expensive now. It would have been fine back then, but it's too expensive now. And you can see him start to get cold feet. He's like, I'm still committed to the acquisition. And I'm going to talk to the employees. I'll go through the, the trouble of talking to the employees, but I really need that, really need that cheaper price. Yeah, it's that scene. Avoid good, paying it's, lawyers. It's, it's that good, that bad, cheaper. and the ugly deal. They're all looking at each other, waiting for who's going to draw first and it, uh, or back down first. And I yeah. and I feel like we're we're still a little ways from that. But I agree with you. I think, what, what would this ever be about other than get the price as low as you can? Why wouldn't yeah. you do that? Yeah, that makes yeah. the most sense to me. Uh, yeah. lo looking at how this all played out, you know, blow by blow. Yeah. Uh, you know, what else makes sense to me is World Emoji Day coming this Sunday. And ahead of that, folks at Emojipedia have drawn up a draft version of select submissions for Emoji 15.0. Uh, these will be uh, under consideration for approval by Unicode in September. So not all of them are necessarily going to make it. Uh, but under consideration are a pushing hand. Say no to the hand, yeah. uh, a shaking face, it's kind of scared and 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 stuff. A moose, we haven't had a moose emoji. We didn't have a goose emoji. We didn't have a pink heart. Red mm. hearts, we have purple hearts, no pink yeah, hearts. That's true. A Wi-Fi sign. Mm. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones in there. This is the smallest draft of candidates, though, ever. Uh, oh. Emoji 15 has 31 candidates compared to 14's 112. And 13 and 13.1 combined for 334. So uh, this is the smallest number of emojis that has ever been recommended. You can take the goose back, whoever's in charge. Just take that back. We don't like geese. Geese are no, terrible. It's the Mendoza emoji. <laughs> it's, I know. That's the problem. In fact, you know, that'll be my call for help, Tom. If that goose finally gets me, I'll just send you that emoji as I struggle to get my phone. And <laughs> if any, anybody doesn't know, there's a, there's a goose that Scott calls Mendoza. That is, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and he's a jerk. He's the bane wants, of his existence. He wants me dead, as best I can tell. So. <laughs> <laughs> Down with these. All right, let's check out the mailbag real quick. Uh, David weighed in on our story about BMW Korea uh, providing things like heated seats as a subscription. Uh, David says, as a Tesla owner, I'm familiar with software options to activate after purchase. The only common subscription so far in Tesla's that requires an ongoing subscription right now is premium connectivity, which makes sense to me as it's relying on outside data connectivity. I bought the home link option for my garage door, but it and other upgrades are one-time purchases, which while not inexpensive, are in line with my expectations of pricing given the car. And in the case of home link, included some transmitter hardware. Subscriptions for included hardware with no connectivity requirements would alienate me as a customer. If I was in the market, unless there was ample verifiable evidence that the base price of the vehicle had been significantly reduced accordingly, if I didn't need those features. Uh, so yeah. David going like, I'm fine paying Tesla for some stuff, even if it's kind of software based because it's connectivity, because it's hooking me up with something outside the car. But if BMW wants me to pay for heated seats that are already in the car and don't need the Internet to work, 
David's not having it. I agree. I had a similar conversation with a Tesla owner next door to me who um, – he he worried that the future of electrics and the future of cars in general was this kind of feature creep where they would assign subscriptions to things that are ridiculous. Look like they're trying to push. It I'm like, that's what's happening, man. You gotta. We either gotta fight this or just let it happen. I don't know which. Yeah. But. Uh, and then John, speaking of cars, wrote in when we talked with Nika about uh, developing for autonomous cars on Monday, and we talked a lot about Apple's autonomous car. John said on Friday you mentioned Apple had their self-driving car prototype in Montana for testing. I see from the reports that they were driving it between Bozeman and Big Sky, which is a road I'm intimately familiar with after decades of driving it. I'd be very curious how it or any other autonomous driving system would do on that road as it's miles of winding, twisting road with awful visibility and but a single stretch barely long enough to pass. Worse, it's usually packed full of tourists and campers. It's a beautiful drive, but frustrating for even us meatbag drivers. Uh, I have to say, John, I don't know if this was your intention or not, but that made me raise Apple's autonomous car worthiness in my estimation of like, wow, that's right. Those, those roads up in Montana are, are, are pretty windy. I've, I've driven on some, some of them. So if it can do that well, you know, yeah, it doesn't have to deal with as many unexpected situations, but you know, low visibility and windy roads, apparently it can do that. So yeah, it's like yeah. football players, uh, training in the sand. As soon as they hit the turf, they're just way more prepared than those guys that didn't train in the sand. To me, it's yeah. like that a little bit. I know it's more complicated, but you know, give, throw more wrenches into the system and work that system out. Yeah. Maybe I'll buy your car over somebody else. Well, in either case, uh, this meat bag is very appreciative that John wrote in with the on the ground report, uh, from Montana. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Scott Johnson, for being with us. Uh, real quickly, tell folks what you got going on. Sure. Uh, all kinds of stuff happening over at frogpants.com. If you're interested in any of the shows we produce or any of the artwork I make or the store that's over there, all kinds of reasons to hang out over there, you can do that. Um, just put up a brand new episode of a, a show we call Play Retro, which is on the Frog Pants Network. Uh, if you like video games, there are a couple shows for you. If you like other entertaining properties, there's other shows for you. The point is there's tons of shows. Go check it out. That's frogpants.com. And if you're trying to find me in public, the best way to find me is on Twitter at twitter.com slash Scott Johnson. A special thanks to Webb Bixby, who's been supporting us for a long, long, long time. Thank you, Webb, for being there for us. Uh, lots of years of support, lots of dollars of support, and all uh, well appreciated. Thank you, Webb Bixby. There's a longer version of this show that's about to start. If you're a patron, get ready for Good Day Internet, available at patreon.com slash DTNS. We are live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Come join us, dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Lamar Wilson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>